students that are at SIUE and uh, the community colleges around. Uh, and we are a church plant here. We started this church a few years ago. Uh, we've got some other congregations in the area that we're partnered very closely with. Uh, we've got a church in the city, uh, the Crossings Church Interbelt. We've got a church in O'Fallon, Missouri, the Crossings Church, St. Charles County. We've got a church in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, we're all independent, but we're all really close friends, uh, and we kind of work together and support each other. We're actually forming a team to, to start a fifth church uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and we're going to be researching locations for where to send that team. That's something that all of us are going to get to participate in. If you're part of a small group, we'll be talking about that more uh, as we go. Some of you are looking at me like you, you, you don't know what this is all about. We're basically going to be looking at, at places to start our next church and researching it and trying to help with the effort there. Uh, so if you're confused, you will not be in the future, I promise. We'll, we'll explain it. Um, I heard there's 220 kids at the Refocus Retreat this weekend. So um, that's where a lot of ours are today. Now, that's just not just our group. That's also uh, the other congregations that are involved over there. But that's the biggest group we've ever had. Uh, and so things are going really good at the Crossings Church. Um, if you're new to the Crossings, uh, I want you to know you're in a safe place. Uh, we are not your typical church where it's people that mostly grew up in church that are here. Most of the people that are part of the crossings did not grow up in the church. Um, and so uh, a lot of the people that are members of our church, they didn't grow up hearing all these Bible stories and stuff that those of us that maybe grew up going to Bible class would have heard. And so uh, it's kind of fun for me because I get to teach and I get to teach an audience that is learning stuff for the first time a lot of the time. Um, so it's, it's, it's fun for me. Uh, we're in a series here uh, on the, I, basically the identity of God. Uh, and because God is certain things, there are things in life that I should not have to concern myself with or be worried about. There are certain things because God is, I know he's going to take care of it. Because God is good, because God is just, because God is loving, because God is compassionate, because God is all-powerful, because God is all-knowing. There are certain things I can put my faith in God to take care of where I don't have to worry about it. Guess what? I'm not God, and neither are you, but he is, and he's good. There are things that we can take to the bank and things we can anchor our faith on because of that. And so that's what this series is kind of about. We are, after this, guys, next month, going to be starting something called Real Truth Cinema. Uh, now, if you don't know what that is, if you've been around the crossings for a while, you probably have heard of Real Truth. Uh, I'm a movie buff, uh, and I know we have a lot of movie buffs here. Uh, I was an arts major in college. Um, I, I Radio, television, and film, that was my first career. Uh, I believe film is one of the highest forms of art we can have right now because we've got uh, music, you've got the visual arts, you've got video, you've got all the different arts kind of coming together. But movies can be a powerful teaching tool. Um, movies frequently illustrate truth that we find in Scripture. Uh, truth is truth no matter where you find it. Amen? Jesus and Paul used pop culture to teach. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. Jesus quoted a book that wasn't even in the Bible to make a point a couple of different times. It was popular literature uh, among the Jews. Paul did the same thing. He would quote popular literature sometimes in his teaching, especially if he was teaching to an audience that wasn't Jewish, if they were Greek. He would sometimes quote Greek, Greek poetry. Uh, and it would be like a poem that was about Zeus, but Paul would say, hey, this poem's about Zeus, but actually that truth is truth. It's, you apply it to God. And he would, he would make these points. So anyway... We've got these guys who use popular culture and things in the culture to teach. That's what we're trying to do with Real Truth Cinema. We're taking a, a form uh, where somebody's telling a story or somebody's making a point. We're going to show those movies, and if they illustrate biblical truth, we're going to then show how this shows up in the movie and in, in, in the scripture, how this biblical truth is illustrated by the movie. I have a lot of fun with these lessons. Uh, I think you guys will too. If you have any friends that like movies, if you have any friends that are into film, this is a great event and will be a great series to get your friends involved in. Uh, we always have a bump in attendance when we do Real Truth. Um, that's because you guys are inviting, but also people are connecting with what's being said. Uh, so we'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm excited about it. Um, but today, we are going to jump into the topic of anxiety. Because God is, 
I can be emotionally stable. Did you know that? Well, you can. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into Matthew 6. God, thank you for bringing us together today. I want to pray you be with our students who are away from us today. Uh, I pray you bless them and your spirit be with them. I pray they come back fired up, ready to reach their campus. I thank you for all the camps we've gotten to have this summer with the high school, junior high, and the kids. Uh, everybody is uh, glad to be back home, but we had such a good time together. Um, I pray you bless our uh, service today as we look into your word. Help us to take your truth and apply it to our lives. God, help us to understand the best life possible is wrapped up in a relationship with you. Help us to be close to you today, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Anybody in here want to make a confession? You struggle with stress and anxiety consistently in life. Okay. Uh, guess what? Stress and anxiety is not getting better. It's getting worse. Uh, the National Institute of, or excuse me, the National Library of Medicine has done several studies. They have found that anxiety is on the increase, not on the decrease in society. Especially among younger people, there are uh, 50 and under. The younger you get, the higher the level of anxiety that's being reported. It is getting worse and worse. Cases of anxiety, depression, suicide, substance abuse disorders, all these are on the rise. They're not getting better, they're getting worse. That's what all the psychologists, all the studies are saying. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the world does not deal with anxiety very well, right? Things aren't getting better. Now, is the world attempting to deal with anxiety? Of course. There's a whole industry dedicated to it, multiple industries now dedicated to it, medicines dedicated to it, psychological approaches, therapy approaches. But what we see in all of this is it's not getting better, it's getting worse. People are getting more stressed, not less stressed. That's because the world does not handle worry and anxiety very well. The world never has. If you want to handle your stress and you want to handle your anxiety, well, you got to look at what God says about it. Now, we look at the Bible here at the crossings, just to the side, okay? Just so you know where we're coming from, if you're just checking out Christianity or faith, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We teach from the Bible on Sundays because we believe the Bible has authority. I believe when I open up the Bible and I look at what the Bible says, I'm actually looking at what God thinks about a situation. If I'm looking for some instruction for life, when I find commands in the Bible, I look at that as God's commands to my life. So if the Bible says something about stress and anxiety, or if Jesus says something in the Bible about it, that means this is what God thinks about this topic. And so my goal as a disciple of Jesus and somebody that wants to honor God with my life is when I look in the Bible and I see, okay, God says this, but I'm thinking this over here. You know, God says I should look at anxiety and stress this way, but I've been looking at it over here this way. Okay, if my view does not align with God's view, whose view needs to change? My view, okay? So this is why the Bible is so important. Because this is why we open the Bible and look at it, guys. Because we believe it has the authority from God to give us instruction for life. And when I look in the Bible and I see that the Bible is calling me to do something different in life that I'm not doing, what do I need to do? I need to do what the Bible says, right? So this is meant to be practical. You, coming on Sundays, guys, and opening up the Word, we don't just open up the Word to put our time in the Word. The point of this is to take what we're learning and actually put it into practice. If we don't get to the putting it into practice portion, we're, we're doing it wrong, okay? We're, we're, we're doing it wrong. We've got to put this stuff into practice. We're going to look at some stuff that Jesus says about stress and anxiety. And I can tell you right up front, it's going to challenge all of us. It's going to challenge us. It's, it's even going to seem unhelpful, okay? I'm just going to put that out there. Not going to seem very helpful right on the front end. We're going to have to think through this. Let's look at this now. Now, in Matthew 6, this is Jesus talking to a group of people who are relatively poor. These are poor Jews. Now, he's just got telling them right before this not to store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He tells them where your heart is, 
uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So make God your treasure. You know, that's kind of the point. And then right after he makes this point, make God your treasure, now he's going to get into talking about worry. And he says in, in verse 25, do not worry about your life, okay? Do not worry about your life. What does Jesus say about worry? Don't do it. Don't do it, okay? Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? You might want to underline that. You have little faith right there. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here's the punchline. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that's the word of Jesus Christ. So what does Jesus Christ, the king of the universe, the one who has all the answers, the one who never sinned, the one who is the wisest man that ever walked the planet, even wiser than Solomon. What does he have to say about worry? Jesus says not to worry. Just don't worry about it. Remember how I said it doesn't seem helpful? What do you think about worry, Jesus? Well, I think you should not do it. Well, thank you. That does not help my... My life, Jesus, don't do it, right? Just stop it. Just stop it. I mean, I say that to my kids. They said, yeah. They don't listen either sometimes, right? Just stop it. This does not seem particularly helpful at first glance. 25, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. <clears throat> how can you even do that? God says not to worry. Right? How can you even do that? Does anybody feel like that's impossible? Nobody wants to raise their hand, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all, you know you do. You're good not to raise your hand, though, because good, would God call you to do something that's impossible for you to do with his help? He may call you to do something that's impossible for you to do by yourself. But God doesn't call us to do anything by ourselves. Did you know if he calls you to do something, he is always willing to help? Always. And not only that, not only is he willing to help, he has put you in a family that is designed to be there to help. None of us were designed to do this stuff on our own. When God calls us to do something hard, Guys, there's some stuff that God's going to call you to do that you can't do by yourself. You're going to need his help. But there's some things he calls you to do that you can't do without the help of the church. And by church, I don't mean a meeting, guys. I mean your friends that love Jesus, that love you, that are part of your spiritual family. When I say church, I mean spiritual family that you are tightly involved in. There's no such thing as a Christian without a church. Not a thing. Okay, um, worry, the word here, merimanao in, in the original language, 
it means to be apprehensive. It means to have anxiety. It means, uh, and this was helpful to me in understanding this, it means undue concern. It means an overemphasis of, you're overly concerned, okay? That's when, when the Bible says worry and anxiety, when Jesus says that, it means there's an overemphasis on this concern to the neglect of other things. Worry is the antithesis to trusting God. Did you guys notice when Jesus is, is, is rebuking them for worry, he says, you have little faith? You guys notice that in the text? Had you underline that? Worry is set up as the antithesis to faith. Worry is set up as the antithesis to hope. You guys remember the biblical definition of elpis, hope? Confident expectation. You guys remember this? What is hope? Confident expectation in the future. If you believe the gospel, if you believe Jesus is the king of the universe, that he's coming back someday, that he's going to make everything right, everything is going to be Everything is going to be made right when Jesus comes back. If you believe that, you've got a confident expectation that no matter what's taking place in life right now, there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. If there's darkness in my life right now, my faith and my hope tells me it's not going to stay that way. If I'm having a bad day today, that doesn't mean every day after this is going to be bad. Like I've got hope that God is good, that God has got good things in store for me, that he's going to make things better, that he's going to make things right, that all this injustice and stuff in the world is not going to stay that way. Ultimately, Jesus is going to, he's going to make it right. That's hope, okay? Now regret, if I've got regret, that's where I feel really bad about something in the past, right? Something that I did, it's where I'm focused in the past, that's regret. But if I've got worry and anxiety, worry and anxiety is typically not focused backwards. Where is worry and anxiety focused? Worry and anxiety is focused toward the future. I feel like I don't have good things coming to me. I feel like I don't have anything to look forward to. I feel like this trial that I'm going through is going to be really hard and I don't want to deal with the pain. I don't want to deal with the conflict. You know, you're feeling anxiety over something in the future. Okay? Worry and anxiety about the future. If hope is confident expectation, what is worry and anxiety? Dread. Dread. So hope, confident expectation that God is good and good things are coming. Worry and anxiety, dread. I can't look forward to the future. Right? Do you guys see the difference in perspective? And how one is, like I could see Jesus on the cross still having hope. Still thinking like, I'm, if anybody was going through a trial, it was him in that moment. He's on the cross. And he's still got hope. Because of that, he's able to say things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or, today, you'll be with me in paradise, thief on the cross. You know, he's able to think about others. He's still able to see that pride. Man, what if, what if he had fallen into despair on the cross? That wouldn't have been good. That would have been the opposite of faith. That would have been a sin. It would have been a sin. Worry is the antithesis to trusting God. Now that's tough. That's tough. Does that mean every little worry in life? Okay, I don't know. I think there's degrees to it, maybe. You know, if I'm running late and I'm anxious about being late, I don't really see that as abandoning my faith. You know what I mean? But if my worry cripples me and I can't get out of bed, or if my worry poisons my attitude where I feel like I don't have anything to look forward to, and I'm cynical, and I'm angry, if, if my worry affects my character to the point where I stop being Christ-like, I have crossed a line. 
if my worry dominates my attitude where I can't see good in my future, I have crossed the line. If my worry incapacitates me where I cannot be the person that God has called me to be, I've crossed the line. If worry causes me to sit down and pout, I've crossed the line. Am I like Jesus in my worry? Or am I unlike Jesus in my worry? Wherever my worry leads me to be unlike Jesus, I have crossed the line. I hope that gives you a little bit of clarity. Some of this is Take some judgment. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about what? Goodness gracious, Paul. Give us a little bit of leeway, man. Anything? That's kind of all-encompassing. And it just happens to be in the Bible that we believe is God's word. Dang it, why does this one have to be God's word? Why couldn't he make it a little, why couldn't he lower the bar just a little bit? Do not be anxious about anything unless it's really warranted, right? Does he know my schedule? Does he know the demands that I have on me? Do not be anxious about anything. Did this guy raise children? Like, obviously he's single, right? Right? No, this is God's word. Do not be anxious about anything. So if that's God's word but I find myself being shackled by anxiety all the time. What do I do with that? You know, sometimes people struggle with anxiety. It's hard to even deal with it because you bring stuff up like this and they find out they're not doing something right and what do they feel? Oh, man, come on now. You telling me the devil doesn't know what he's doing with you? I'm going to give them a lesson on anxiety, and instead of applying this, we're going to use it to make them sin more. Look, it's attitudinal, a lot of it. It's attitudinal. Um, don't be anxious about anything. Paul's just repeating what Jesus has said to this crowd. Do not worry. Do not worry. Don't fall into the trap. Why does Jesus say not to worry? Why? Well, Jesus says worry doesn't help. It doesn't help anything. And he points this out. He says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Does your worry accomplish anything? Now, what worry and anxiety is, generally, is you are concerned about a situation and you are thinking over and over and over and over and over and over in your mind how you can exercise some kind of control. It's, how can I say just the right thing? Or maybe you're thinking back over the conversation you had, and you're replaying it in your mind, and I should have said this, and I should have said that, and then they would have said this, and I would have said this, you know, and you're going back and forth. You're laying in bed at night, you can't sleep thinking about a conflict, right, or something. Um, does any of that give you any control? Does any of that add to a solution? Does any of that add anything to your life? No, all that's doing is, is sucking your energy right out of your heart and soul. That's all that's doing, man. Jesus says not to do it. It doesn't help. Worry just adds stress, man. There's so many studies that have been done for people that, that live in an in, in anxious way. Uh, it shortens your life. Every single major system in your body is affected negatively by stress and anxiety. The cardiovascular system, the heart, major organs, like you will shorten your life if you... Don't deal with anxiety in a healthy way. If you're just an anxious person, it will take years off. It doesn't do anything for you. In Proverbs 12, the writer says, An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Have you ever felt just like a weight 
in your life because of stress and anxiety where you get up and there's a situation you're dealing with, you know, a loved one or something that is just, you're at your wit's end. And you get up and your heart hurts. That's what probably bothers me more than anything. Just as somebody that works in ministry, seeing people wreck their lives hurts. We deal with a lot of people. You know, people come to the church here and they're at various stages of spiritual development. We have a lot of people that come in here that are just learning about God for the first time. We have a lot of people that come in here that are just getting off drugs for the first time. You know, or something like that. Or people that are, have been in toxic relationships, abusive marriages, you know, situations of abuse with kids and stuff like that. To see people take steps to get their lives better, you invest in them, you give them your heart, and then to see those people sometimes make terrible decisions. Where I can't tell you how many people start pursuing God for the first time in life. And they start getting really close to God. And then suddenly, somebody that's never had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, suddenly, uh, there's a relationship that starts right when they're starting to pursue God. And guess what happens a lot of times? That pursuit of God goes right out the window. Man, the devil knows what he's doing. He just knows what he's doing. It hurts to see people make bad decisions. I feel stress and anxiety over you guys sometimes. And I've got to be reminded that that's not going to add anything. What is my stress and my anxiety over this person's bad decision going to do for that person or for me? You know what I can do is I can take that to, to God in prayer. And that's what I do. I take it to God in prayer and I pour out my heart to him. And, and I just... I try my best just to let him be in control. And there have been many, many tear-filled nights where I have prayed over people that are killing themselves or harming others. But that's what I feel stress and anxiety over more than anything. It's people that you love that are, that are not making good decisions. But I take it to God in prayer. I feel weighed down, though, when I'm anxious. You know, when I can release that anxiety, it's like a weight is taken off. And that feels good. It feels good. A heavy heart, man, it will weigh a man down and a woman. Why does Jesus say not to worry? Well, it doesn't do anything. Okay. Secondly, <clears throat> Jesus says worry lessens our impact on the world. Jesus says, worry lessens our impact on the world. In Matthew 6, 31, he says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. The point that he's making, when he says pagans, these are, uh, back then it was just the Romans. It was anybody that didn't worship God. Uh, they pretty much worshiped the pantheon, the Roman pantheon. Uh, the Romans believed, the pagans believed the gods were mean. They were believed they were capricious. They believed if you didn't sacrifice to them in a certain way, they'd kill you. So they had this jacked up view of God, and they had this jacked up way of living. They did not see a good God in heaven. They didn't believe in that. They believed gods were mean. And uh, they worried and worried, and Jesus points out that this anxious behavior is common among those that don't know God. His point is those of us that do know God we need to show the world something different. If we're people of faith and we believe Jesus is king and we believe Jesus is going to make everything right, we believe that, our faith tells us that, then we're going to look at the world a certain way compared to if we didn't have any of those convictions. Guys, if Jesus wasn't going to come back and make everything right, we would have a reason to despair. If the world was just going to be broken forever and everybody was going to be in their sin forever and there was no hope, yeah, we would have reason to be in despair. But guys, the whole point of Jesus' ministry is to give us hope. It's to help us live where we don't have to be weighed down by this fear of the future because we've got a bright future ahead. And if disciples of Jesus deal with stress and anxiety the same way everybody else in the world deals with stress and anxiety, guys, we are not going to give the world hope. 
And Jesus' concern is for his church, his people, he wants us to be a light in the world. Man, nobody takes a light and puts it under a bowl. But what are you doing if you live where stress and anxiety cause you to take your eyes off Jesus? Guys, it is just like you're taking your light and putting it under a bowl. Because you are going to join in with the chorus of the rest of the world and their view of the future and, and stress and anxiety. we got to show them something different. Jesus helps me find stability. And he does it by reminding me of several truths. Jesus reminds me that I trust that God cares for me. I trust that God cares for me. Now, this is what he says to the people uh, that he's talking to. He says, look, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Okay, now, that's what Jesus says to this crowd. Peter calls to God's care as the cure for anxiety. He says in 1 Peter... Cast all your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. The cure for anxiety is trusting in God's love and provision. That's the cure for it. It's trusting in him. Um, secondly, Jesus helps me find stability when I put God first. If I trust that God really does care for me, this is not that hard. And this is my conviction, man. I believe that God wants everybody to have the best life they can have. I believe that. Because of what Jesus says in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I believe that every single person was uniquely designed by God with stuff to do in the world. I believe that because of what it says in Ephesians, that God created us with things in mind for us to do ahead of time. He's talking about individuals. You've got unique spiritual gifts. You have got the ability to bless people that I can't bless. You've got the ability to connect with some people that I can't connect with because of your unique makeup, where you came from, how God made you, what your gifts are, what you're into. You are going to be able to help people that I can't help because you're going to be able to connect with them in a way that I can't. And God set it up that way. And so each of us in life has got a choice to make. We can either live life and try to do what God wants us to do in the world, which would be our design, or we can try to do something else that doesn't have God in mind. I believe the very, very, very best life is found up in, in, in just trying to pursue what God would have for you. He designed your life. He's your creator. When you live according to design, it, life is better. All sin is, is living outside of design. That's all it is. Whenever you break God's law, you're, you're going against the creator. But he's good. He wants a relationship with you. And here's the punchline for Jesus. When he, when he, the cure for worry and anxiety is putting God first. He says in Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Okay? This is a very practical statement from Jesus. When, when Jesus says, seek first his kingdom, who's king? Who's the king? Jesus is the king, right? God is the king. Um, what does it take to have a king? It takes a king... Takes people, right? Subjects. If I want to be part of Jesus' kingdom, if I want to seek first his kingdom, I want you to think of it this way. 
If I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, I'm seeking first Jesus' rule in my life. Because if I want to be part of Jesus' kingdom, who is the king? Jesus is the king. So if I'm seeking to be part of his kingdom, I want to be part of his kingdom. If the king says jump, I say how high? Because I want to be part of the kingdom. I want him to be my king. I want you to be my king. Okay? You want your stress and anxiety to be taken care of. Jesus says the first step is make sure I'm king first. Make sure that I'm in charge first. Make sure I'm in charge first. What would you have me do, Jesus? How would you have me deal with this situation, Jesus? What does your word say about this, Jesus? Am I putting too much stress and anxiety on myself, Jesus? How is this affecting my heart? Take it to the king. Seek first his kingdom. That means you seek first his rule in your life. Then he says seek first his righteousness. What is righteousness? Really simply, it just means doing what's right. Righteousness means doing what God says is right. Okay? If it's real righteousness, God gets to define what real righteousness is. His definition of righteousness and what's right is going to be different from the world's definition. Okay? You can be a good person according to a worldly definition and God says, no, you're not. You need to listen to good according to the way God says it. Seek first his kingdom. That means seek first his rule in my life. Seek first his righteousness. This means I seek to do what God says is right. This means I seek to do what God says is right. If, if God says my attitude is not right, if my stress and my anxiety has crossed a line, if I'm being crippled, if I'm being irritable or unfaithful because of the presence of overdue worry in my life, what does God say to do? Well, he says to get that out of my life. Okay, seeking first his righteousness means I'm going to take this serious, man. I'm going to do what God says is right. I'm going to seek to please God. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8, Jeremiah says this, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Notice here, who does it say is the blessed one? The one who what? Trusts in the Lord. You guys understand, trusting in the Lord is the antithesis to worry. Trusting in the Lord <coughs> is the antithesis to anxiety. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. If you have confidence in the Lord, that means you are looking forward to the future. If you do not have confidence in the Lord, that means you are not looking forward to the future. If you have faith, you have confidence in the Lord. If you struggle with faith, you struggle with confidence in the Lord. Guys, your worry and anxiety is not a worry and anxiety problem. Your worry and anxiety is a faith problem. And that's why it's such a big deal. It's a faith issue. Faith is optimistic. Faith, we, we believe Jesus is good and he's got good things in store for us. It's optimistic. It's hope-filled. But when we fall into despair or fear, guys, that is the antithesis to faith. So what do we need to do if we're struggling with this? What do we need to do? Well, I confess worry as sin. I need to confess my worry as sin. Sinful anxiety, if you're concerned to the point, again, where you're crippled or where you're falling into despair or where your attitude is being affected to the point that you're being unchristlike, that's where you slip into sin. Okay? Society says we don't control our emotions. Society says you're subject to your emotions. 
Guys, what God calls us to is, is not to be subject to emotion. Doesn't mean you're free from emotion. Guys, is it wrong to get angry? It can be, but no. Not just on the surface. Does God get angry? Okay. What, what's wrong is when you let your emotion be in charge. God has emotions. I mean, God has grief. He experiences anger. He experiences all these emotions. But he's never subject to them. Meaning that he never makes his emotion, lets his emotion be in charge. He has emotions, but he's not subject to them. He's, he's always in control. It's the same with us, guys. We can have anxiety, but we don't have to let it have control. We don't have to slip into a, a, a part where it turns into sin because we let it turn our, take our eye off God. It's possible to have emotions without being ruled by them. It's important to remember, guys, when we slip into sin in our attitude, it's ultimately an offense against God. It says in, in 1 John 3, everyone who sins breaks God's law because sin is the same as breaking God's law. So who are we sinning against? We're sinning against him. It's not, it's not just a selfish thing. We're actually sinning against God when we slip into sinful anxiety. In Proverbs 28, 13, how do you deal with a struggle? Uh, there's several passages that tell us how to deal with the struggle in our life. This is one of them. Uh, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You know, I've struggled with uh, sins in my life that I have tried to get over by myself. And until I told another person what was going on and asked them for help and praying for me and just giving me some accountability, I didn't get over that stuff. Uh, I was addicted to porn for years and years uh, when I was younger. I can remember thinking when I first became a Christian, I was 23. And that was one of my biggest fears and struggles and sources of my anxiety was how do I stop this behavior that I've gotten so dependent on? Um, it wasn't until I talked with other people about it and had a, a group accountability, like, and I put software on my computer that sent all the websites that I went to to another person. And that was per, a person in my church, right? I was able to get help with that because I let other people in. But that was something that I struggled with privately for years. It never told anybody. And I was never able to get over it until I told other people and let other people in. That's been a long time ago now. Um, but there have been other sins like that that I've struggled with. Attitudes and things that have just habitually been a struggle for me. Until I told somebody else about it and asked for prayer, I didn't really make much progress. I think there's some stuff that we can struggle with in life that we can't easily get over on our own. And I think the more I learn about God um, and get closer to him, he set it up like that. He set up humanity where we have to depend on him and each other. And I think until we get to where we can do that, we're not the people God created us to be. He didn't create us to go through life by ourselves. He didn't create us to be Lone Ranger Christians. That's not a thing. It's something people invented in their own minds. He didn't create us to be by ourselves. Like, he created us to be with him and with one another in community. And until we engage with him and that community the way that he says to, we don't grow to be mature. And if you come around church and you're not open about your struggles and your sins, you're not engaging the community the way God set it up to be engaged. And so you don't get all the benefits of it. It's kind of like, you know, you're going to go take your truck to the mechanic and get it worked on, but he's not going to use any of the tools of the toolbox. He's just going to use his fingers for everything. Like, doofus, go get the tools, you know. We do the same thing at church. Like, you can come in here, you got all the tools at your disposal, but now nah, I'm just going to go twist this lug nut with my finger. I don't want that wrench. People might, you know, people might think I'm a mechanic. Uh, listen, 
It's okay if you come to church and people outside the doors think you're a Christian. It's okay. Matter of fact, it's encouraged. We're supposed to. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you want to get help, you need to use the tools at your disposal. If you've got stress and anxiety, maybe you're feeling uncomfortable this morning talking about it, but you need to talk with another person about it and work through. A lot of times, uh, if you are habitually stressed out and habitually anxious, usually there's more stuff to unpack than something just real simple. Because there's usually a reason for that. There's usually trauma or something else. We have a lot of abuse victims here. We have a lot of people that have come out of really bad situations. There's going to be stuff to work through, but work through it. Don't just give up. God didn't design you to go through life a ball of anxiety. He didn't design you to do that. He designed you to be a source of hope and light in the world. And if you're a ball of anxiety all the time, you're not giving hope to anybody. The only thing people are going to be hoping is you leave because you're stressing them out. Seriously. It's contagious. But you can be a source of light and you can be a source of hope. Confession and repentance lead to forgiveness. Whoever conceals their sins doesn't prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. If you confess and renounce them, you find mercy. That's a good thing. Not only that, confession and repentance can lead to this time of refreshing. In Acts 3.19, um, I think it was Peter talking, Peter or John, he's telling a group of people there, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance means you change your mind. Metanoia means you change your mind. You quit seeing your situation the way you've been looking at it. If you are a ball of anxiety, you have not been thinking about your situation through the lens of faith. You may need some help to do that. If you are consistently, habitually anxious to the point that it's debilitating or crippling, you have not believed what God has said about you. You are struggling with your faith. Um, that's something that you may need help with. You may need to talk with somebody about it. Sometimes, man, we can get so deceived when, when we just stay up here. If we just stay in here, we don't ever get out of here. You know, we just kind of internalize. You can get so off track with your thinking, especially as it relates to yourself, until you let somebody else that can bring a different perspective to you, maybe that is spiritually mature, uh, it's, you're going to struggle. But you can, man, we can psych ourselves out especially with this anxiety stuff. You just you can psych yourself out. You need to talk with somebody. Talk with somebody that loves the Lord and loves you about it. Super duper important. Um, when you confess, when you genuinely confess and repent, you get this time of refreshing. Now I've experienced this, man, when I've messed up bad, but then I've decided, hey, I want to get this out of my life, and I genuinely repent and I get that sin off of my chest or get it out, there is a time of refreshing that comes from God, and it feels good. And that's what we need uh, when you've been weighed down. Um, another cure for anxiety, guys. We'll close uh, this point and one other. I choose thanksgiving. Uh, praising God combats anxiety. In Philippians 4, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything. Guess where Paul was when he wrote this? He was in prison. He was chained to a guard. Guess what was going to happen to him? He was going to get taken in a Roman arena, and he was going to get his head chopped off. That's what was going to happen to him. Do not be anxious about anything. It's the guy that wrote that. He's in prison. He's in prison when he's writing this. Does that change your perspective? Paul in this cushy life, telling me not to worry. Does he know the bills I have to pay? Does he know I got passed over for that promotion? Does he know my car's tire is flat? He was in prison. 
He was about to get his head chopped off. He said, don't be anxious about anything. They come to Paul and they say, we're going to kill you. I don't get to go be with Jesus. Well, then we're not going to kill you. Well, then I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. <laughs> they couldn't win. Like, What do we do with this guy? It doesn't matter what we say. Did Paul experience anxiety? Yeah, but from what we can tell here, man, he always kept it in check in terms of what mattered most. He didn't let his anxiety over his situation affect his purpose in the world and his willingness to bless people. I really think that's where we cross the line with anxiety is Jesus does not want us to get a point where our anxiety becomes the focus, where we don't look at hurting people around us. And I really think that's the danger, is if, if Satan can get us so wrapped up in our own problems, in our own situation, we don't look at the lost world around us. We don't care about them. That's just another problem to have to deal with, and we got too much problems right now. I really think that's the, the game here. Because you can be in some really bad situations like chained to a Roman soldier and about to get your head chopped off. And he even expresses, you know, in some of his letters, he expresses discomfort. Like, this is in our small groups. We do it in various meetings. We'll just take some time and, hey, what do you have to praise God for this week? That is not just something that we do just to have something to fill time at our meetings. You guys know we do that intentionally. Because if we're not intentional about praising God, we will find reasons to fall into despair. Every time in the Bible, when Israel in the Old Testament was praising God, things were going well for them. But when they stopped praising God and they started grumbling, they started grumbling, that's when things got off track when they let their stress and their anxiety rule the day, they took their eyes off God, and that's when they got into big trouble throughout the Old Testament. It's when they took their eyes off God. Guys, when we are thankful intentionally, when we praise God intentionally, when we come together on Sundays, we're not just singing words. You need to engage your heart and think through what you're saying and sing as a prayer to God. Be reminded that God is good. Be reminded that he's worthy of praise. And thank him from a thankful heart. Think about the good things God has given you. God, that, that'll, that'll protect you against stress and anxiety. Thanksgiving, as it says here, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And a thankful spirit, guys, if you are truly thankful in your spirit... Guys, a thankful spirit, a posture of thankfulness toward God is the opposite of a posture where you're full of anxiety and feel like you don't have anything good. It's the opposite. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. That inner self being renewed day by day. Guys, that is the cure for stress and anxiety. It's a worshipful, thankful heart. Last thing, Jesus says, I need to surrender my way of thinking. I need to surrender my way of thinking. The world says you have no control over your stress and anxiety. Uh, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, take every thought, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You have the ability to take every thought captive and to make it obedient to Christ. If there are thoughts that are engaging your mind, that are getting your eye off the ball, that are causing you to struggle in your attitude toward God, that are causing you to despair, those are thoughts that need to go, and you have control over that. You have control over that. The world says, 
you don't have control over that. The world says you're a victim of your emotions. The world says whatever happens to you just kind of happens to you and just, just let it happen. Well, no. You have control. You have the Spirit of God. If you're a Christian here today, living within you, you have control. You have tools at your disposal. We just need to be faithful. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me tell you, uh, when I became a Christian, um, I had a gentleman, several actually, that helped me grow. And one of the things they would help me do, because I was spending time with them, is they spent enough time with me to, to realize uh, there was things that I needed to learn. And so as a young man, I was still you know, very worldly and had a very bad attitude sometimes. It was kind of mean. I liked to fight. Uh, and so there were some edges that needed to be knocked off. Uh, and so as I hung out with my mentors, you know, they would occasionally say, hey, Wes, let's go, let's go talk for a minute. And then they would open the Bible and say, hey, you know that thing you did the other day? Look at what the Bible says about this. And they would challenge my behavior. Now, I had a choice to make. As they were presenting the Bible to me, like, hey, you, you didn't handle this right, or you, you treated this person wrong, or whatever. It was usually a corrective. I had a choice to make. Am I going to listen to these men who are bringing the Bible to me and try to do this or not? What I tried to do was apply God's word. And what I found is over time, uh, through practice, I was not the same man two or three years later that I had been prior. Why? Because I was taking God's word and I was applying it very personally to my life because I had some people who cared enough about me to point some stuff out and to say, hey, you need to think about this. That allowed my mind over time to be transformed because I was taking God's word incrementally, step by step, as situations would come up and I was applying it to my life because I had help to do that, had people in my life to, to help me do that. That's how this works. If, if you want to really have a good life, you need to get close to God and you need to do what he says. And I'm telling you, the, the biggest command in the whole Bible, somebody came and said, asked Jesus, hey, what's the greatest command in all the scriptures? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the first and greatest commandment. That means if I'm going to love God, I'm not just going to believe that he's up there. I'm going to try to live my life like he says to live it. That's loving God. Jesus said the second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole Bible hangs on these two commandments. Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you want to have a great life, if you're here today, we were talking about anxiety, and you want help with your anxiety, or if you want help with anything else that life has thrown at you, it's all going to start with loving God. If you want your life to get better, you need to love God. Say, what does that look like? Well, if you don't know what that looks like, you need help. And that's why the church is so very important. Um, God designed us to learn about him from other people. That's the way he set this whole thing up. He designed me to have certain gifts to share with others, and he designed you to have certain gifts to share with others. There are things that God has created in you. He has designed you to make the world a better place through, through doing the stuff that he has designed you to do. I don't know what that is. That's part of the adventure is figuring that out. It's going to be different for you as, as it is to me, as, as it is to others, but there's going to be some universals too. One of the universals is God wants you to be close to him and he wants to help you bring others close to him. I can tell you that. Don't know what that's going to look like, but the very best life you can have is going to be wrapped up into embracing that. I can tell you that for sure. <coughs> um, we're going to close this morning and I'm going to give you um, just some action steps that you can take next. Go ahead and pull your uh, communication cards out.
That's a cardstock piece of paper that's in your bulletin. Uh, that's got space for you to put your name and information down, but it's also got a spot for you to respond. Um, now, this is super important, guys, because we can get used to coming and opening God's Word and not do anything with it. That's not helpful. Uh, if you were convicted this morning or if you feel like there was something that needs to change in your life, I want to encourage you now to identify on that card what that thing is, and I want to encourage you to ask for prayer for it. Um, if you are just checking the church out, uh, we have small groups that meet uh, on Sundays frequently. Um, we are a church of small groups. Uh, 100% of our members participate in small groups. Uh, it's required for membership. The reason we do that is because we believe God works through relationships. Uh, it's what we see in the Bible. Um, and so we want everybody to be relationally connected to the church because it's good to come you know, on Sundays and hear a lesson, but you're not going to get your needs met uh, if that's all that you're getting because uh, a small group, Instead of sitting around looking at the back of heads, you're going to sit in a circle. You're going, to, you're going to get to know people's names. People are going to get to know your story. People are going to get to know your unique hurts and your unique gifts and all that stuff. People are going to be able to help you where you are. Um, when you join a small group, you know, it may be that you're just investigating a relationship with God. Maybe you need to study the Bible with someone and get some questions answered. Uh, there may be other needs present. Uh, but those will be met in that group. We want you to make some really good friends here at the crossings because we believe that God works through those relationships and we believe closeness uh, is super duper important for spiritual development just because there's so much God does through the church. Um, I'll let you look that card over and respond appropriately. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we're going to uh, sing a song. After my prayer, that's going to give you time to fill that card out. Uh, and then we will sing one more song after that and pass some baskets, and you can drop your card in that basket. Uh, if you're visiting, guys, we please don't give money. I mean, we're not going to say no if you want to. Like, our money is better than yours. But we did not get you here to get money from you. We really just want to give something to you today. Uh, so if we can do that, please just drop the card in there and, and let us uh, get to know you. Um, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we will sing a song after that, and you can fill that card out, uh, and we will wrap up. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us together today. Uh, I want to pray for the students that are uh, at the retreat, that they will have a really, really good weekend. We miss them today. I'd be uh, glad to see them back next week, uh, but do pray you work through their retreat. I pray for us today uh, that you will help us learn to faithfully deal with anxiety. Uh, God, help us to, to be the people that you created us to be, where we're leaning into you in faith. Help us not to 